Moby Dick, chapters 81 to 82. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Stuart Wills. Moby Dick by Herman Melville. Chapters 81 and 82. Chapter 81. The Pequod Meets the Virgin. The predestinated day arrived, and we duly met the ship Jungfrau, Derek de Der, master of Bremen. At one time the greatest whaling people in the world, the Dutch and Germans are now among the least, but here and there, at very wide intervals of latitude and longitude, you still occasionally meet with their flag in the Pacific. For some reason, the Jungfrau seemed quite eager to pay her respects, while yet some distance from the Pequod she rounded to, and dropping a boat, her captain was impelled toward us, impatiently standing in the bows instead of the stern. "'What has he in his hand there?' cried Starbuck, pointing to something wavingly held by the German. "'Impossible! A lamp-feeder!' "'Not that,' said Stubb. "'No, no! It's a coffee-pot, Mr. Starbuck. He's coming off to make us our coffee, is the Yarman. Don't you see that big tin can o' there alongside of him? That's his boiling water. Oh, he's all right, is the Yarman.' "'Get along with you,' cried Flask. It's a lamp feeder and an oil can. He's out of oil and has come a begging. However curious it may seem for an oil ship to be borrowing oil on the whale ground, and however much it may inadvertently contradict the old proverb about carrying coals to Newcastle, yet sometimes such a thing really happens, and in the present case Captain Derek de Dare did indubitably conduct a lamp feeder, as Flask did declare. As he mounted the deck, Ahab abruptly accosted him, without at all heeding what he had in his hand, but in his broken lingo the German soon evinced his complete ignorance of the white whale, immediately turning the conversation to his lamp-feeder and oil-can, with some remarks touching his having to turn into his hammock at night in profound darkness, his last drop of Bremen oil being gone, and not a single flying fish yet captured to supply the deficiency, concluding by hinting that his ship was indeed what in the fishery is technically called a clean one, that is, an empty one, well deserving the name of Jungfrau, or the Virgin. His necessities supplied, Derek departed, but he had not gained his ship's side when whales were almost simultaneously raised from the mastheads of both vessels, and so eager for the chase was Derek, that without pausing to put his oil-can and lamp-feeder aboard, he slewed round his boat, and made after the leviathan lamp-feeders. Now the game having risen to the leeward, he and the other three German boats that soon followed him, had considerably the start of the Pequod's keels. There were eight whales, an average pod, Aware of their danger, they were going all abreast with great speed straight before the wind, rubbing their flanks as closely as so many spans of horses in harness. They left a great wide wake, as though continually unrolling a great wide parchment upon the sea. Full in this rapid wake, and many fathoms in the rear, swam a huge humped old bull, which, by his comparatively slow progress, as well as by the unusual yellowish incrustations overgrowing him, seemed afflicted with the jaundice, or some other infirmity. Whether this whale belonged to the pod in advance seemed questionable, for it is not customary for such venerable leviathans to be at all social. Nevertheless, he stuck to their wake, though indeed their backwater must have retarded him, because the white bone or swell at his broad muzzle was a dashed one, like the swell formed when two hostile currents meet. His spout was short, slow, and laborious, coming forth with a choking sort of gush, and spending itself in torn shreds, followed by strange subterranean commotions in him, which seemed to have egress at his other buried extremity, causing the waters behind him to up-bubble. "'Who's got some paragoric?' 
said Stubb. He has the stomach ache, I'm afraid. Lord, think of having half an acre of stomach ache. Adverse winds are holding mad Christmas in him, boys. It's the first foul wind I ever knew to blow from astern. But look, did ever whale yaw so before? It must be he's lost his tiller. As an overladen Indiaman, bearing down the Hindustan coast with a deck-load of frightened horses, careens, berries, rolls, and wallows on her way, so did this old whale heave his aged bulk, and now and then, partly turning over on his cumbrous rib-ends, expose the cause of his devious wake in the unnatural stump of his starboard fin. Whether he had lost that fin in battle, or had been born without it, it were hard to say. "'Only wait a bit, old chap, and I'll give you a sling for that wounded arm,' cried Cruel Flask, pointing to the whale line near him. "'Mind he don't sling thee with it,' cried Starbuck. "'Give way, or the German will have him.' With one intent, all the combined rival boats were pointed for this one fish— because not only was he the largest and therefore the most valuable whale, but he was nearest to them, and the other whales were going with such great velocity, moreover, as almost to defy pursuit for the time. At this juncture the Pequod's keels had shot by the three German boats last lowered, but from the great start he had had, Derrick's boat still led the chase, though every moment neared by his foreign rivals. The only thing they feared was that, from being already so nigh to his mark, he would be enabled to dart his iron before they could completely overtake and pass him. As for Derrick, he seemed quite confident that this would be the case, and occasionally, with a deriding gesture, shook his lamp-feeder at the other boats. "'The ungracious and ungrateful dog!' cried Starbuck. He mocks and dares me with the very poor box I filled for him not five minutes ago. Then, in his old intense whisper, Give way, greyhounds, dog to it. I tell you what it is, men, cried Stubb to his crew. It's against my religion to get mad, but I'd like to eat that villainous yarman. Pull, won't you? Are you going to let that rascal beat you? Do you love brandy? A hogshead of brandy, then, to the best man. Come, why don't some of you burst a blood vessel? Who's that been dropping an anchor overboard? We don't budge an inch. We're becalmed. Halloo, here's grass growing in the boat's bottom. And by the Lord, the mast there, budding. This won't do, boys. Look at that yarman. The short and long of it is, men. Will you spit fire or not? Oh, see the suds he makes, cried Flask, dancing up and down. What a hump. Oh, do pile on the beef. Lays like a log. Oh, my lads, do spring. Slapjacks and quahogs for supper, you know, my lads. Baked clams and muffins. Oh, do, do spring. He's a hundred barreler. Don't lose him now. Oh, don't, don't. See that yarman. Oh, won't you pull for your duff, my lads. Such a sog, such a sogger. Don't you love sperm? There goes three thousand dollars, men. A bank, a whole bank the bank of england oh do 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 what's that yarman about now at this moment derrick was in the act of pitching his lamp feeder at the advancing boats and also his oil can perhaps with the double view of retarding his rival's way and at the same time economically accelerating his own by the momentary impetus of the backward toss the unmannerly dutch dogger cried stubb Pull now, men, like fifty thousand line of battleship loads of red-haired devils. What do you say, Tashtego? Are you the man to snap your spine in two and twenty pieces for the honor of old Gayhead? What do you say? I say pull like goddamn, cried the Indian. Fiercely, but evenly incited by the taunts of the German, the Pequod's three boats now began ranging almost abreast and so disposed, momentarily neared him. In that fine, loose, chivalrous attitude of the headsman, when drawing near to his prey, the three mates stood up proudly, occasionally backing the after-oarsman with an exhilarating cry of, "'There she slides now! Hurrah for the white-ash breeze! Down with the yarman! Sail over him!' 
But so decided an original start had Derrick had, that spite of all their gallantry he would have proved the victor in this race, had not a righteous judgment descended upon him in a crab which caught the blade of his midship oarsman. While this clumsy lubber was striving to free his white ash, and while in consequence Derrick's boat was nigh to capsizing, and he thundering away at his men in a mighty rage, that was a good time for Starbuck, Stubb, and Flask. With a shout, they took a mortal start forward, and slantingly ranged up on the German's quarter. An instant more, and all four boats were diagonally in the whale's immediate wake, while stretching from them on both sides was the foaming swell that he made. It was a terrific, most pitiable, and maddening sight. The whale was now going head out, and sending his spout before him in a continual tormented jet, while his one poor fin beat his side in an agony of fright. Now to this hand, now to that, he yawed in his faltering flight, and still at every billow that he broke he spasmodically sank in the sea, or sideways rolled towards the sky his one beating fin. So have I seen a bird with clipped wing making affrighted broken circles in the air, vainly striving to escape the piratical hawks. But the bird has a voice, and with plaintive cries will make known her fear. But the fear of this vast, dumb brute of the sea was chained up and enchanted in him. He had no voice, save that choking respiration through his spiracle, and this made the sight of him unspeakably pitiable. While still, in his amazing bulk, portcullis jaw, and omnipotent tail, there was enough to appall the stoutest man who so pitied. Seeing now that but a very few moments more would give the Pequod's boats the advantage, and rather than be thus foiled of his game, Derrick chose to hazard what to him must have seemed a most unusually long dart, ere the last chance would forever escape. But no sooner did his harpooner stand up for the stroke than all three tigers, Queequeg, Tashtego, and Dagoo, instinctively sprang to their feet, and standing in a diagonal row, simultaneously pointed their barbs, and darted over the head of the German harpooner their three Nantucket irons entered the whale. Blinding vapors of foam and white fire, the three boats, in the first fury of the whale's headlong rush, bumped the Germans aside with such force that both Derrick and his baffled harpooner were spilled out and sailed over by the three flying keels. "'Don't be afraid, my butter-boxes!' cried Stubb, casting a passing glance upon them as he shot by. "'You'll be picked up presently. All right. I saw some sharks astern, St. Bernard's dogs, you know. Relieve distressed travellers!' Hurrah! This is the way to sail now, every keel a sunbeam. Hurrah! Here we go like three tin kettles at the tail of a mad cougar. This puts me in mind of fastening to an elephant in a tilbury on a plain. Makes the wheel spokes fly, boys, when you fasten to him that way. And there's danger of being pitched out, too, when you strike a hill. Hurrah! This is the way a fellow feels when he's going to Davy Jones. All a-rush down an endless inclined plain. Hurrah! This whale carries the everlasting mail. But the monster's run was a brief one. Giving a sudden gasp, he tumultuously sounded. With a grating rush, the three lines flew round the loggerheads with such force as to gouge deep grooves in them. While so fearful were the harpooners that this rapid sounding would soon exhaust the lines, that using all their dexterous might, they caught repeated smoking turns with the rope to hold on, till at last, owing to the perpendicular strain from the lead-lined chocks of the boats, whence the three ropes went straight down into the blue, the gunwales of the bows were almost even with the water, while the three sterns were tilted high in the air. And the whale soon ceasing to sound, for some time they remained in that attitude, fearful of expending more line, though the position was a little ticklish. But though boats have been taken down and lost in this way, yet it is this holding on, as it is called, this hooking up by the sharp barbs of his live flesh from the back, this it is that often torments the leviathan into soon rising again to meet the sharp lance of his foes. Yet not to speak of the peril of the thing, it is to be doubted whether this course is always the best, 
for it is but reasonable to presume that the longer the stricken whale stays under water, the more he is exhausted, because, owing to the enormous surface of him, in a full-grown sperm whale something less than two thousand square feet, the pressure of the water is immense. We all know what an astonishing atmospheric weight we ourselves stand up under, even here above ground in the air. How vast, then, the burden of a whale, bearing on his back a column of two hundred fathoms of ocean! It must at least equal the weight of fifty atmospheres. One whaleman has estimated it at the weight of twenty line of battleships, with all their guns and stores and men on board. As the three boats lay there on that gently rolling sea, gazing down into its eternal blue noon, and as not a single groan or cry of any sort, nay, not so much as a ripple or a bubble, came up from its depths, what landsman would have thought that beneath all that silence and placidity the utmost monster of the seas was writhing and wrenching in agony? Not eight inches of perpendicular rope were visible at the bows. Seems it credible that by three such thin threads the great leviathan was suspended like the big weight to an eight-day clock? Suspended? And to what? To three bits of board! Is this the creature of whom it was once so triumphantly said, Canst thou fill his skin with barbed irons, or his head with fish-spears? The sword of him that layeth at him cannot hold, the spear, the dart, nor the habergeon, he esteemeth iron as straw, the arrow cannot make him flee, darts are counted as stubble, he laugheth at the shaking of a spear. This the creature, this he? Oh, that unfulfillment should follow the prophets! For with the strength of a thousand thighs in his tail, Leviathan had run his head under the mountains of the sea to hide him from the Pequod's fish-spears. In that sloping afternoon sunlight, the shadows that the three boats sent down beneath the surface must have been long enough and broad enough to shade half Xerxes' army. Who can tell how appalling to the wounded whale must have been such huge phantoms flitting over his head? "'Stand by, men! He stirs!' cried Starbuck, as the three lines suddenly vibrated in the water, distinctly conducting upwards to them, as by magnetic wires, the life and death throbs of the whale, so that every oarsman felt them in his seat. The next moment, relieved in great part from the downward strain at the bows, the boats gave a sudden bounce upward, as a small ice-field will, when a dense herd of white bears are scared from it into the sea. "'Haul in! Haul in!' cried Starbuck again. "'He's rising!' The lines, of which hardly an instant before not one hand's breadth could have been gained, were now in long, quick coils flung back, all dripping into the boats, and soon the whale broke water within two ship's lengths of the hunters. His motions plainly denoted his extreme exhaustion. In most land animals there are certain valves or floodgates in many of their veins, whereby, when wounded, the blood is, in some degree at least, instantly shut off in certain directions. Not so with the whale, one of whose peculiarities it is to have an entire non-valvular structure of the blood vessels so that when pierced even by so small a point as a harpoon, a deadly drain is at once begun upon his whole arterial system, and when this is heightened by the extraordinary pressure of water at a great distance below the surface, his life may be said to pour from him in incessant streams. Yet so vast is the quantity of blood in him, and so distant and numerous its interior fountains, that he will keep thus bleeding and bleeding for a considerable period, even as in a drought a river will flow, whose source is in the well-springs of far-off and undiscernible hills. Even now, when the boats pulled upon the whale, and perilously drew over his swaying flukes, and the lances were darted into him, they were followed by steady jets from the new-made wound, which kept continually playing, while the natural spout-hole in his head was only at intervals, however rapid, sending its affrighted moisture into the air. From this last vent no blood yet came, because no vital part of him had thus far been struck. His life, as they significantly call it, was untouched. As the boats now more closely surrounded him, the whole upper part of his form, 
with much of it that is ordinarily submerged, was plainly revealed. His eyes, or rather the places where his eyes had been, were beheld. As strange misgrown masses gather in the knot-holes of the noblest oaks when prostrate, so from the points which the whale's eyes had once occupied now protruded blind bulbs, horribly pitiable to see. But pity there was none. For all his old age, and his one arm, and his blind eyes, he must die the death and be murdered in order to light the gay bridles and other merry-makings of men, and also to illuminate the solemn churches that preach unconditional inoffensiveness by all to all. Still rolling in his blood, at last he partially disclosed a strangely discoloured bunch or protuberance the size of a bushel, low down on the flank. "'A nice spot!' cried Flask. "'Just let me prick him there once.' "'Avast!' cried Starbuck. "'There's no need of that.' But humane Starbuck was too late. At the instant of the dart, an ulcerous jet shot from this cruel wound, and goaded by it into more than sufferable anguish, the whale, now spouting thick blood with swift fury, blindly darted at the craft, bespattering them and their glorying crews all over with showers of gore, capsizing Flask's boat, and marring the bows. It was his death-stroke for by this time so spent was he by loss of blood that he helplessly rolled away from the wreck he had made, lay panting on his side, impotently flapped with his stumped fin, then over and over slowly revolved like a waning world, turned up the white secrets of his belly, lay like a log, and died. It was most piteous, that last expiring spout, as when by unseen hands the water is gradually drawn off from some mighty fountain, and with half-stifled melancholy gurglings the spray column lowers and lowers to the ground, so the last long dying spout of the whale. Soon, while the crews were awaiting the arrival of the ship, the body showed symptoms of sinking with all its treasures unrifled, Immediately, by Starbuck's orders, lines were secured to it at different points, so that ere long every boat was a boy, the sunken whale being suspended a few inches beneath them by the cords. By very heedful management, when the ship drew nigh, the whale was transferred to her side, and was strongly secured there by the stiffest fluke chains, for it was plain that unless artificially upheld, the body would at once sink to the bottom." It so chanced that almost upon first cutting into him with the spade, the entire length of a corroded harpoon was found embedded in his flesh, on the lower part of the bunch before described. But as the stumps of harpoons are frequently found in the dead bodies of captured whales, with the flesh perfectly healed around them, and no prominence of any kind to denote their place, Therefore there must needs have been some other unknown reason in the present case fully to account for the ulceration alluded to. But still more curious was the fact of a lance-head of stone being found in him, not far from the buried iron, the flesh perfectly firm about it. Who had darted that stone lance, and when? It might have been darted by some Norwest Indian long before America was discovered. What other marvels might have been rummaged out of this monstrous cabinet there is no telling, but a sudden stop was put to further discoveries by the ships being unprecedentedly dragged over sideways to the sea, owing to the body's immensely increasing tendency to sink. However, Starbuck, who had the ordering of affairs, hung on to it to the last, hung on to it so resolutely indeed that when at length the ship would have been capsized if still persisting in locking arms with the body, then when the command was given to break clear from it, such was the immovable strain upon the timber-heads to which the fluke chains and cables were fastened, that it was impossible to cast them off. Meantime everything in the Pequod was a slant. To cross to the other side of the deck was like walking up the steep gabled roof of a house. The ship groaned and gasped, many of the ivory inlayings of her bulwarks and cabins were started from their places by the unnatural dislocation. In vain handspikes and crows were brought to bear upon the immovable fluke-chains to pry them adrift from the timber-heads, 
and so low had the whale now settled that the submerged ends could not be at all approached, while every moment whole tons of ponderosity seemed added to the sinking bulk, and the ship seemed on the point of going over. "'Hold on! Hold on, won't ye?' cried Stubb to the body. "'Don't be in such a devil of a hurry to sink. By thunder, men, we must do something or go for it. No use prying there. Avast, I say, with your handspikes, and run one of ye for a prayer-book and a penknife, and cut the big chains.' "'Knife? Ay, ay, cried Queequeg, and seizing the carpenter's heavy hatchet, he leaned out of a porthole, and steel to iron, began slashing at the largest fluke-chains. But a few strokes full of sparks were given when the exceeding strain effected the rest. With a terrific snap, every fastening went adrift. The ship righted, the carcass sank. Now this occasional, inevitable sinking of the recently killed sperm-whale is a very curious thing, nor has any fisherman yet adequately accounted for it. Usually the dead sperm-whale floats with great buoyancy, with its side or belly considerably elevated above the surface. If the only whales that thus sank were old, meagre, and broken-hearted creatures, their pads of lard diminished and all their bones heavy and rheumatic, then you might with some reason assert that this sinking is caused by an uncommon specific gravity in the fish so sinking, consequent upon this absence of buoyant matter in him. But it is not so, for young whales, in the highest health and swelling with noble aspirations, prematurely cut off in the warm flush and may of life, with all their panting lard about them, even these brawny, buoyant heroes do sometimes sink. Be it said, however, that the sperm whale is far less liable to this accident than any other species. Where one of that sort go down, twenty right whales do. This difference in the species is no doubt imputable in no small degree to the greater quantity of bone in the right whale, his Venetian blinds alone sometimes weighing more than a ton. From this encumbrance the sperm whale is wholly free." But there are instances where, after the lapse of many hours or several days, the sunken whale again rises, more buoyant than in life. But the reasons of this are obvious. Gases are generated in him, he swells to a prodigious magnitude, becomes a sort of animal balloon. A line of battleship could hardly keep him under then. In the shore whaling, on soundings among the bays of New Zealand, when a right whale gives token of sinking, they fasten buoys to him, with plenty of rope, so that, when the body has gone down, they know where to look for it when it shall have ascended again. It was not long after the sinking of the body that a cry was heard from the Pequod's mastheads, announcing that the Jungfrau was again lowering her boats, though the only spout in sight was that of a finback, belonging to the species of uncapturable whales, because of its incredible power of swimming. Nevertheless, the finback spout is so similar to the sperm whales that by unskillful fishermen it is often mistaken for it. And consequently Derrick and all his host were now in valiant chase of this unnearable brute. The virgin crowding all sail made after her four young keels, and thus they all disappeared far to leeward, still in bold, hopeful chase. Oh, many are the Finbacks, and many are the Derricks, my friend. Chapter 82 The Honor and Glory of Whaling There are some enterprises in which a careful disorderliness is the true method. The more I dive into this matter of whaling, and push my researches up to the very springhead of it, so much the more am I impressed with its great honorableness and antiquity, and especially when I find so many great demigods and heroes, prophets of all sort, who one way or other have shed distinction upon it, I am transported with the reflection that I myself belong, though but subordinately, to so emblazoned a fraternity. The gallant Persis, son of Jupiter, was the first whaleman, and to the eternal honor of our calling be it said that the first whale attacked by our brotherhood was not killed with any sordid intent. 
Those were the knightly days of our profession, when we only bore arms to succor the distressed, not to fill men's lamp-feeders. Every one knows the fine story of Persis and Andromeda, how the lovely Andromeda, the daughter of a king, was tied to a rock on the sea-coast, and as Leviathan was in the very act of carrying her off, Persis, the prince of whalemen, intrepidly advancing, harpooned the monster, and delivered and married the maid. It was an admirable artistic exploit, rarely achieved by the best harpooners of the present day, inasmuch as this Leviathan was slain at the very first dart. And let no man doubt this archite story, for in the ancient Joppa, now Jaffa, on the Syrian coast, in one of the pagan temples there stood for many ages the vast skeleton of a whale, which the city's legends and all the inhabitants asserted to be the identical bones of the monster that Persis slew. When the Romans took Joppa, the same skeleton was carried to Italy in triumph. What seems most singular and suggestively important in this story is this. It was from Joppa that Jonah set sail. Akin to the adventure of Persis and Andromeda, indeed by some supposed to be indirectly derived from it, is that famous story of St. George and the dragon, which dragon I maintain to have been a whale, for in many old chronicles whales and dragons are strangely jumbled together, and often stand for each other. Thou art as a lion of the waters, and as a dragon of the sea, saith Ezekiel, hereby plainly meaning a whale. In truth, some versions of the Bible use that word itself. Besides, it would much subtract from the glory of the exploit had St. George but encountered a crawling reptile of the land, instead of doing battle with the great monster of the deep. Any man may kill a snake, but only a Persis, a St. George, a coffin, have the heart in them to march boldly up to a whale. Let not the modern paintings of this scene mislead us, for though the creature encountered by that valiant whaleman of old is vaguely represented of a griffin-like shape, and though the battle is depicted on land and the saint on horseback, yet, considering the great ignorance of those times, when the true form of the whale was unknown to artists, and considering that, as in Persis's case, St. George's whale might have crawled up out of the sea on the beach, and considering that the animal ridden by St. George might have been only a large seal or seahorse, bearing all this in mind, it will not appear altogether incompatible with the sacred legend and the ancientest drafts of the scene to hold this so-called dragon no other than the great Leviathan himself. In fact, placed before the strict and piercing truth, this whole story will fare like that fish, flesh, and foul idol of the Philistines, Dagon by name, who being planted before the Ark of Israel, his horse's head and both the palms of his hands fell off from him, and only the stump or fishy part of him remained. Thus, then, one of our own noble stamp, even a whaleman, is the tutelary guardian of England, and by good rights we harpooners of Nantucket should be enrolled in the most noble order of St. George. And therefore let not the knights of that honourable company, none of whom I venture to say have ever had to do with a whale like their great patron, let them never eye a Nantucketer with disdain, since even in our woollen frocks and tarred trousers we are much better entitled to St. George's decoration than they." Whether to admit Hercules among us or not, concerning this I long remained dubious. For though, according to the Greek mythologies, that antique Crockett and Kit Carson, that brawny doer of rejoicing good deeds, was swallowed down and thrown up by a whale, still whether that strictly makes a whaleman of him, that might be mooted. It nowhere appears that he ever actually harpooned his fish, unless indeed from the inside, Nevertheless, he may be deemed a sort of involuntary whaleman. At any rate, the whale caught him if he did not the whale. I claim him for one of our clan. But by the best contradictory authorities, this Grecian story of Hercules and the whale is considered to be derived from the still more ancient Hebrew story of Jonah and the whale, and vice versa. Certainly they are very similar. 
If I claim the demigod, then, why not the prophet? Nor do heroes, saints, demigods, and prophets alone comprise the whole role of our order. Our grand master is still to be named, for like royal kings of old times, we find the headwaters of our fraternity in nothing short of the great gods themselves. That wondrous oriental story is now to be rehearsed from the Shaster, which gives us the dread Vishnu, one of the three persons of the godhead of the Hindus, gives us this divine Vishnu himself for our lord. Vishnu, who, by the first of his ten earthly incarnations, has forever set apart and sanctified the whale. When Brahma, or the god of gods, saith the Shaster, resolved to recreate the world after one of its periodical dissolutions, he gave birth to Vishnu to preside over the work. But the Vedas, or mystical books, whose perusal would seem to have been indispensable to Vishnu before beginning the creation, and which therefore must have contained something in the shape of practical hints to young architects, these Vedas were lying at the bottom of the waters. So Vishnu became incarnate as a whale, and sounding down in him to the uttermost depths, rescued the sacred volumes. Was not this Vishnu a whaleman, then? Even as a man who rides a horse is called a horseman? Persis, St. George, Hercules, Jonah, and Vishnu. There's a member roll for you. What club but the whalemans can head off like that? End of chapters 81 and 82.